Hey kids, these are the review problems for your chapter 9 test. Use these to help you. You don't need to watch all of them, but you could. It's going to be very long. There are a lot of problems. Make sure you're ready and you know every part of this chapter except 9-2 and 9.6. So here is number 1C. The directions say to find HF. And if you remember from the way this picture looks, this is a problem from 9.3. Um, we have a right triangle and its altitude from the right angle hits the hypotenuse. It's called the altitude on the hypotenuse. So we've got those three equations that we can use with this type of problem. We need to find HF. HF we represent with C. The 2 square root of 5 we represent with A. And the 4 we represent with Y. So the equation that we will be using is the one that looks like A squared equals Y times C. And we'll just plug in what we know and solve for C. So A is 2 square root of 5. We will square that. We need to make sure to put that in parentheses. That equals y, which is 4 times c. So to square 2 squared of 5, we're going to square the 2 and square the square root of 5. 2 squared is 4. Square root of 5 squared is 5. And we will multiply these two values together. And you could actually do two things right here. Since you see that mul both sides are being multiplied by 4, you could actually divide both sides by 4 to figure out that c is 5. But let's say you didn't see that. You would do 4 times 5, which is 20. Then you would divide both sides by 4 to find the value of c. And you will find that c equals 5. There are five problems from number 3. The first is A. In this right triangle, you know two of its sides, so the best bet is by using the Pythagorean theorem. We would not be able to use trig ratios because we don't know the value of either of the acute angle measures, and we would not be able to use special right triangles because we don't know that we have 30, 60, or 45 degree angles. So let's go ahead and start. Side C is that long side across from the right angle, that's 34. The two legs are A and B, doesn't matter which one you call which. And we will write down our Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So we have 16 squared plus B squared equals 34 squared. 16 squared is 256. B squared. 34 squared is 11.56. To get b squared by itself, we're going to minus 2.56 from both sides. So b squared equals 900. Whenever you get to the step where you have a variable squared equals a number, you can always take the square root of both sides. The square root of b squared is b. The square root of 900, I believe that is a perfect square because 30 times 30 equals 900, so B has a length of 30. And that's the missing side of our triangle. For this problem, we're going to do the same type of thing. We know two sides of a right triangle. We're going to use Pythagorean theorem. Side C is going to be the 5 squared of 5 because it's across from the right angle. Um, I can call 3 squared of 5 A or B. I'm just going to call it A. Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. a is 3 squared of 5. Make sure whenever you're squaring a radical with a coefficient in front that you always put it in parentheses so you remember to square both parts. Same thing with the 5 squared of 5. We'll put that in parentheses. Okay, remember we're going to square um, the coefficient in front and the radical part separately and then multiply those together. So for 3 squared of 5 squared, 3 squared is 9, the square root of 5 squared is 5. Remember that the square and the square root symbols undo each other. 
and we'll multiply those together in a second. Down here, 5 squared is 25. The square root of 5 squared is also 5. If we simplify those, 9 times 5 is 45. 25 times 5 is 125. Then we will subtract 45 from both sides to get the b squared by itself. And b squared equals 80. To figure out b, we will take the square root of both sides. Square root of b squared is b. Square root of 80, I don't believe that's a perfect square. So we will simplify it. A prime number that will go into 80 is 2. A prime number that will go into 40 is also 2. A prime number that will go into 20 is 2. A prime number that will go into 10 is 2. And we end up with a prime number, so we stop. We circle our pairs. We've got two pairs of 2. Each pair counts as 1, 2. We'll multiply those 2's together and get 4 for our outside number. The uncircled 5 stays inside. So the missing side of this right triangle is 4 square root of 5. And if you look, we talked about one of the Pythagorean triples, or we might have mentioned it in passing. If you look at the three sides of the triangle, they all have square root of 5. So if you were to divide that out to simplify the ratio of the sides, we will get 3, 4, 5 for our side lengths, which is a Pythagorean triple. And that can be found in 9.6 if you'd like to learn about some other Pythagorean triples. They could save you some time. For this right triangle, to find its missing sides, we actually only know one side. So we actually have two choices. We could use the trig ratios or we could use the special right triangles. I will use the special right triangles here because we have a 60 degree angle and we can use the 30, 60, 90 expressions for the sides. The side that we know is the 15, it is across from the 60 degree angle, and that side has the expression of x square root of 3. The other leg across from the 30 degree angle is our x, and the side across from the hypotenuse is our 2x. So if we could find x, we know the missing leg, and then if we double it, we know the missing hypotenuse's length. We're always going to start with the side length that you know. We know the 15. And its expression is x squared of 3, so we're going to start by setting those equal to each other. To get x by itself, we're going to divide both sides by that square root of 3. So x equals 15 over square root of 3. And fractions are okay, however this fraction is not okay because we can't have a square root in the denominator. So we will rationalize the denominator by multiplying the numerator and denominator by square root of 3 because square root of 3 over square root of 3 is 1. And when we multiply straight across, we get 15 square root of 3 for our numerator. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is just 3 for our denominator. Then we can simplify these two outside numbers. 15 over 3 is the same as 5. So x equals 5 square roots of 3. And x is one of the missing sides. That's the missing leg. So, oops. So there's one side. Now if we were to double that for the hypotenuse, we would do 2 times the 5 squared of 3. The 2 can only be multiplied by the 5 because they're both outside numbers. So 2 times 5 is 10. 10 squared of 3, that is our hypotenuse. So here's this side, and here's that other leg. For 3h, we know two sides of a right triangle, so to find the third side, we can use Pythagorean theorem. We know our a and b, these are our legs, we need to find the c. I know that fraction three and a half is freaking all out. Let's go ahead and resist the urge to change it to a decimal. Let's leave it as a fraction. Three and a half might be better or easier to use if we convert it to an improper fraction. So if you remember that little horseshoe method back from junior high, two times three is six plus one is seven. 
This is the same as 7 halves. So let's put that in for A and make sure we put that in parentheses because we're going to square that. Plus 12 squared equals C squared. To square a fraction, you just square the numerator and the denominator. So we're going to get 49 for the numerator and 4 for the denominator. We're going to add that to 12 squared. 12 squared is 144. Now to add 49 fourths and 144, we have to have like denominators. Right now, 144 has a denominator of 1. In order for it to have a denominator of 4, we would have to multiply the top and the bottom both by 4. 1 times 4 is 4. 144 times 4 is, is 576. Now that they have like denominators, we can add the numerators together. The denominator will stay 4. And if we add our numerators, we get 625. And these numbers actually are pretty nice for us. The last step is to take the square root of both sides. Remember when you take the square root of a fraction, you can take the square root of the numerator and denominator separately in the same way that we squared the numerator and denominator separately. So the square root of c squared is c. On the left, the square root of 625, that is actually a perfect square, it's 25. And our denominator is 4, the square root of that is 2. And you are welcome to leave your answer as 25 halves. If you want to convert that to a mixed number, it would just be 12 and a half. Again, here's just a typical Pythagorean theorem problem. We know two sides of a right triangle. I think most of you are probably getting pretty good at this by now. A and B are the legs, which are 10 and 24. So we've got 10 squared plus 24 squared equals C squared. 10 squared is 100. 24 squared is... 576. When you add 1576, you get 676. That equals c squared, so you will take the square root of both sides. The square root of c squared is c. 676 may be a perfect square, but I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm thinking it might be 26, but we'll see. Let's go ahead and simplify it. I a prime number that will go into 676 is 2, and that will be 3, 38. A prime number that will go into 338 is also 2, and that will, half of 300 is 150, plus half of 38 is 19. So 169, oop, I recognize that number. A prime number that'll go into 169 is 13, and it'll go in 13 times. So it was actually a perfect square because I don't have any leftover numbers once I pair my numbers together. So my pair of twos counts as one two, my pair of 13s counts as 113, and two times three is 26. So 676 was a perfect square. 26 times 26 is 626, and this is the length of side C. For number four, it's asking for the perimeter of the rhombus. It told us that this was a rhombus, so we know that all the sides are congruent. If we can find one side, we can just multiply by four for the perimeter. I also need to remember that in a rhombus, the diagonals intersect at right angles. So these are right angles. And if I look at this triangle here, it's a right triangle where the legs are 6 and 8. So let's go ahead and use Pythagorean theorem to find that hypotenuse, which will then be 1 fourth of the perimeter. So my 6 and my 8 are my A and my B, and I need to find C. So we've got 6 squared plus 8 squared equals c squared. 6 squared is 36. 8 squared is 64. And 
and 36 plus 64 is 100. If I take the square root of both sides, I will find that C, my hypotenuse, equals 10. So that's one side of the rhombus. So the perimeter is going to be four of these sides, which will be four times 10, which means our perimeter will be 40 units. Number five asks us to find the altitude of this triangle. If I look at the side lengths, they're all the same, which means it's equilateral, which means all of its angles equal 60 degrees. The altitude in an equilateral triangle is also the median, which means it's going to break this side up into two threes. The altitude is what I need to find. I know that these are 60 degrees down here. I know that this is 30 and this is 30 up here. I actually have two choices to find the altitude. Since I know two sides of one of these congruent rate right triangles, the 3 and the 6, I can easily use Pythagorean theorem to find A. Because I have a 30, 60, 90, I can also use that ratio. So I'm going to actually do this in two different ways. Let's go ahead and start with Pythagorean theorem. And I will do this in blue. So in Pythagorean theorem, my altitude's what I need to find. I'll call 3B. 6 will be my C because it's across from the right angle. And here is my right triangle just to make sure we're all clear. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. B is 3. C is 6. 3 squared is 9. 6 squared is 36. If I subtract 9 from both sides, A squared equals 27. And if I take the square root of both of these, the square root of A squared is A. 27, I will need to simplify. A prime number that I'll go into 27 is 3. It goes in 9 times. Then I can use 3 again. It goes in 3 times, and that's a prime number, so I'll stop. I've got one pair of 3s, which will count as 1 to 3, and it will go outside. The uncircled 3 will go inside, so my altitude has a height of 3 squares of 3. We can also use the ratios for 30, 60, 90 right triangle. The side across from the 30 is my x. Oh look, 3 is x. The side across from my 60, I'm sorry, my 90 is 2x. So if 6 equals 2x, x is also 3. And the side across from my 60 is my x squared of 3. That's the side I need to find. That's my a. So since a equals x squared of 3, and I know that x is 3, then a equals 3 squared of 3. Wow. Much simpler than using Pythagorean theorem. Number nine is almost the reverse of the last problem we did. It says if the altitude of an equilateral triangle is 8 squared of 3, find the perimeter. So perimeter will be easy if we can find one side. We can multiply by 3. We've got the perimeter. Remember in an equilateral triangle that the altitude is also the median. So I know that these two sides are going to be congruent. I also know that this angle is 60, this is 30, and then of course we also have 30 and 60 over here as well. All we know about this is that the altitude is 8 square roots of 3. Okay, so since we only know one side of this right of either of these congruent right triangles, we will definitely not be able to use Pythagorean theorem because it's not an isosceles right triangle. So let's go ahead and use our 30, 60, 90 ratios. The side across from the 30 degree angle is x, the side across from the 90 degree angle is 2x, and the side across from the 60 degree angle is x squared of 3. You always start with the side you know. Oh, we know that side. If x squared of 3 equals 8 squared of 3, and I'll just rewrite it to make it clear. 
if I divide both sides by square root of 3, then oh look, x equals 8. And if x is 8, I can plug that into the hypotenuse's side, which is 2x, which means the side of my triangle is 2 times 8, or is 16. And if the side of my triangle is 16, I can easily find the perimeter by multiplying that side by 3. And we get a perimeter of 48 units. What is the length of the diagonal of a 2 by 5 rectangle? Remember, in a rectangle, the diagonals are congruent. So it doesn't matter which one you draw. Since the angles of a rectangle are right, when you draw the diagonal, either one, you've got two congruent right triangles. So you could use actually either of them um, when you're trying to find this diagonal. So I'm going to go ahead and just highlight this one. Because I've got two sides, I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem. I cannot assume that these acute angles are 30 and 60. Sometimes students want to do that when they draw the diagonal of a rectangle, but that is a huge misassumption. The two sides I know are my A and B. We need to find C. That's the diagonal. So let's plug in what we know into the Pythagorean theorem. 2 squared plus 5 squared equals the C squared. 2 squared is 4, 5 squared is 25. When I add those, we get 29. The last step is to take the square root of both sides. Unfortunately, the square root of 29 is prime. So the diagonal of this rectangle is the square, I'm sorry, I, rewrote, I miswrote that, is square root of 29. Let me just rewrite that. And that's it. For this trapezoid, it says find the length of RS. I'm just going to call that X. Um, because you don't have a right triangle, and we know this whole chapter is about right triangles, you have to sometimes draw, an, I'll ex draw in an auxiliary line. Excuse me. The best way to draw it in a trapezoid is to draw the height from one of the top vertices like this and have it make a right angle with the base. Now we actually know two sides of this right triangle. I know that this is 9 because it's going to have the same length as this side over here. This length I can find by subtracting the full 13 length of my bottom base by this 11 which is the same as the top base which means I'm going to get a remainder of 2. So these are the two numbers that I would use with Pythagorean theorem. 2 and 9 are going to be my a and b, and I need to find c. So we've got 2 squared plus 9 squared equals x squared. 2 squared is 4, 9 squared is 81. When you add those, you get 85. And then when you take the square root of both sides, 85 is not a perfect square, so we need to go off to the side and try to simplify it. A prime number that I know will go into 85 will be 5. I believe it goes in 17 times. Unfortunately, 17 is prime. Um, since we don't have any pairs, that means the square root of 85 is already simplified. And that's x. And x represents rs, so rs has a length of square root of 85 units. Number 12 says we have an isosceles trapezoid. I denoted that by showing that the legs are congruent. We've got one triangle on the left formed from the height. It has a 30 degree angle, which means we can use 30, 60, 90. You could also use your trig ratios. I'm going to stick with 30, 60, 90, pretty much because I don't have a calculator handy with me. 
One thing to remember about an isosceles trapezoid is if we draw the other height from the other top vertex, we will create two congruent right triangles, which is very handy because that tells us that this length and this length are congruent. We need to find the length of TV and TZ, which are both part of the right triangle on the left. Um, we know the 30 degree angle. We know that this angle right here is going to be 60. Uh, we actually know VZ. If the whole bottom base is 12 and the top base is 8, then that means this part of the bottom base is also 8. If I subtract that from the 12, I've got 4 left over, which means each side, that bottom leg of each of those right triangles has to be 2. So what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to redraw this right triangle just to make it a little bit easier to use. It's kind of messy. So I've got two here. Let's call this X and this Y. I've got 30 degrees, 60 degrees. All right, we're ready to go. So let's go ahead and use our 30, 60, 90 ratios. The side across from the 30 is always X. Oh, look, I've already labeled it X. The side across from the 90 is 2X. I've labeled it Y. I could just replace that with 2X if we'd like. And the side across from the 60 is always X squared to 3. Since that's the side we know, we're going to actually start there. So X squared of 3 equals 2. To get x by itself, we would need to divide both sides by square root of 3. And x equals 2 square roots of 3. Or, sorry, 2 over square roots of 3. This fraction is absolute, or a fraction is absolutely okay, but this fraction is not because we've got a square root in the denominator. So to rationalize it, we will multiply the top and the bottom by square root of 3 because square root of 3 over square root of 3 is 1. We multiply straight across, so for our numerator, 2 times square root of 3 is 2 square roots of 3. In our denominator, square root of 3 times square root of 3 is just 3, so this is the value of x. x was actually represented the length of tz. If I put my vertices on here, I can see this a little bit better. So tz equals 2 square roots of 3 over 3. There's one of my solutions. The second solution was to find VT, or TV. That is represented with 2x. So since x is 2 squared to 3 over 3, I can just go ahead and replace with that and just multiply that by 2. Remember, when you're multiplying a fraction by a whole number, you only multiply in the numerator by it because that whole number is over 1. And the only part of that numerator, 2 squared of 3, that I can multiply by the 2 is the outside number, the 2, because the other 2 is also outside. Outside with outside, inside with inside. So 2 times 2 is 4. We still have square root of 3, and this is still over 3. So 4 square root of 3 over 3 is the length of VT. Number 13 asks us to find the diagonal of a rectangular solid whose sides are 4, 3, and 12. When you draw your rectangular prism, it doesn't matter how you label the sides 4, 3, and 12, just as long as they each represent three different dimensions. Whenever you need to find the diagonal of a rectangular prism, you will have to be using two right triangles. So I always just start with the triangle that's formed by the diagonal of the base. This angle right here is a right angle. And if I was to redraw that triangle there, it's gonna look like this. It's kinda hard to see it in its 3D form. But I need to find its D, which I'm gonna just label right here. Once I have that length, then I can use that with the triangle formed by it, the 12, and the diagonal of the rectangular prism. So I'm going to go ahead and start here. The 3 and the 4 are going to be my A and B. I'm just going to use Pythagorean theorem, and then C will be my D. 
So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we've got 3 squared plus 4 squared equals d squared. Now if you recognize this Pythagorean triple, it is actually a 3, 4, 5. We should get 5 for our hypotenuse. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. When I add 9 and 16, I get 25. And then when I take the square root of both sides, square root of 25 is 5. Square root of d squared is d. So 5 equals d. And that is the length of the diagonal of my base, or one of my surfaces. Now we can use that to find the length of the diagonal with this triangle right here. And just to make it a little bit easier to see, I'm just going to redraw it off to the side. This D is now this D. So I'm calling it a different D. It does not equal 5. It's another D. I probably shouldn't have used D in my first triangle, but that's okay. So we're going to go ahead and use this triangle. We'll also use Pythagorean theorem. A and B are 5 and 12. The diagonal of the rectangular prism is our C. Some of y'all might recognize this to also be a Pythagorean triple, but if you don't, that's okay. So we've got 5 squared plus 12 squared equals d squared. 5 squared is 25. 12 squared is 144. If we add those, we get 169. And if we take the square root of both sides, the square root of 169 is 13 because 169 is a perfect square. So the length of the diagonal of this rectangular prism is 13. Number 14 wants us to find the perimeter of the square base of a square pyramid. We are told that PR is 20. PR represents our altitude. PS is 25 and that represents our slant height. If I draw a segment from the center of my square to S, then I will have a right triangle. And because I know two of its sides, I can use Pythagorean theorem to find this other side. This other side at the bottom is half of the side length of our square base. So if I find that, I can double it to find one side length of the square base and then multiply it by the four sides of the square. So let's call it A. I'll call my 20 B and 25 is C because it's across from that right angle. So we've got a squared plus 20 squared equals 25 squared. 20 squared is 400. 25 squared is 625. Oops, just 625. To get a squared by itself, I'm going to subtract 400 from both sides. a squared gives you 225. The last step is to take the square root of both sides. The square root of a squared is a. The square root of 225 is actually, 225 is a perfect square and it equals 15. So that is half of the length of one side of my square. That's this part is 15. So if I double it, then I get one side of my square as 30. And if all four sides are 30, then the perimeter of my square base is 4 times 30, since there are four sides. So the perimeter is 120 units. In this problem, we will find the distance from two points, which means we need to use the distance formula. The distance formula is the square root of the difference of our x's squared x2 minus x1 squared, plus the difference of our y values squared, y2 minus y1 squared. You might want to go ahead and label the two coordinates of each point as x and y. The order that you subtract them is not important in this formula because we will be squaring their differences. 
So our two x's are 4 and 1. I'll probably just do 4 minus 1. And then we'll square that. Our two y's are 11 and 15, so I'll do 15 minus 11. And then we'll square that. 4 minus 1 is 3, so we have 3 squared. 15 minus 11 is 4, so we've got 4 squared. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. When I add 9 and 16, I get 25. The last step is to take the square root of 25, which is just 5. So the distance between these two points is 5. Number 23 says, two boats leave the harbor at 9 o'clock a.m. Boat A sails north at 20 kilometers per hour. Boat B sails west at 15 kilometers per hour. How far apart are the two boats at noon? So if they leave at 9 and they want the distance between them at noon, that means that three hours have passed. So let's just say this is the harbor. Boat A sails north. And in three hours, if it's traveling at 20 kilometers per one hour, that means it will have traveled 60 kilometers in those three hours, 20 each hour. Boat B is sailing west at 15 kilometers per one hour. So in three hours, boat B will have traveled 45 kilometers, 15 each hour. Their directions make a right angle, and after three hours at noon, th this distance right here represents their distance at noon. So that's what we need to find. We know two sides of a right triangle. We will use Pythagorean theorem to find that distance. So we know our A and B. We need to find C. Got some big numbers here, but that's okay. So a squared is 45 squared, b squared is 60 squared, and we need to find c. 45 squared is 2,025, 60 squared is 3,600, and when we add those two values, we get... 5,625. The last step is to take the square root of both sides. The square root of 5,625 off the top of my head is not a number that I know, so I'm going to have to go off to the side and simplify this. To do this, I will erase this triangle just so I have a little bit of room. Okay, so... 5, 6, 2, 5. This number appears to be divisible by 5. It's going to go in 1, 1, 2, 5 times. This next number can also be divisible by 5. It's going to go in 2, 2, 5. This number is divisible by 5 as well. It's going to go in 45 times. 45 is divisible by 5. 9 times. 9 is divisible by 3. It goes in 3 times. If I circle my pairs, it appears that I don't have any numbers left over, which means 5,625 is a perfect square. So to figure out what it equals, I'm going to count each pair as one number. And I'm going to multiply them together. 5 times 5 is 25, 25 times 3 is 75, so the square root of 5,625 is 75, that's C, which means these two boats at noon are 75 kilometers apart from one another. 24A has this picture, says find X. This looks exactly like one of those pictures from 9.3 that uses one of those three formulas. So let's go ahead and label what we've got. 10 would be our A, 8 would be our Y, and X is our X. So the formula is A squared equals Y times C. Well, we know that C is made up of x and y added together. 
If y is 8, then we can call c x plus 8. I will use that in place of c. So if we plug in everything, we've got 10 squared equals 8 times x plus 8. So now we have an equation in terms of x, and x is what we're trying to find. So once we solve this equation, we will have what we're trying to find. In order to solve this, we are going to have to distribute. But let's first do 10 squared, which is 100. We'll distribute the 8 to the x and to the 8. 8 times x is 8x, plus 8 times 8 is 64. And this is good because we don't have a quadratic, so it's going to be nice and simple to solve for. Let's subtract 64 from both sides so we can start to get x by itself. We've got 36 on the left equals 8x on the right. When we divide both sides by 8, we find that x has a length of, and I'm perfectly okay with leaving it as a fraction as long as it's simplified, which means we will have to divide the top and bottom both by 4, which will give us 9 halves. You may also write that as 4.5 or 4.5 would also be acceptable. For 24b, we will also use one of the equations from 9.3. 6 is going to be the b, y is the x, and 9 is the y. So I'm going to cross out this y and put x. And when I solve my equation for x, I need to remember that that x represented y. So the equation with the b is b squared equals x times c. c, remember, is x plus y, or in this case, since y is 9, x plus 9. So we will replace that for c. So b is 6, x is x, and c is x plus 9. Some of you are probably already noticing that we're going to have a quadratic when we distribute that x. Let's see what happens. 6 squared is 36. x times x is x squared plus x times 9 is 9x. Because we have a quadratic, we need to get everything to one side. Let's go ahead and subtract 36 from both sides so we get everything onto the right. 0 on the left. On the right, we've got x squared plus 9x minus 36. We will need to factor this into two binomials. They will both begin with just x because my x squared term has a coefficient of 1. We will look at our c term, which is negative 36, and we need to think of numbers that will multiply to make negative 36, but will add to make 9. Since 9 is positive, that means our larger number needs to be positive. And so I'm thinking of 12 and 3 positive 12 and negative 3. Positive 12 times negative 3 is negative 36, and positive 12 plus negative 3 is positive 9, so this will work. We will take each of these binomials and set them each equal to 0. x plus 12 equals 0. x minus 3 equals 0. And when we solve this, we have to subtract 12 from both sides in the first equation, so x equals negative 12. And we have to add 3 to both sides in the second equation, which means that x is positive 3. Since x really represents y, which represents a distance, I cannot use the negative distance. I need to use the positive distance. So we will say that y, and that's my y in green, not my y in orange, equals 3. And there's the missing side. So number 27 is asking us to find x, and x belongs to the leftmost right triangle. We have three right triangles. They are all joined by one side. The only right triangle with two sides is the far right triangle, the far right right triangle, the 12 and the 13, and we would find this other side. I'll call it A. So since we know two sides, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. We actually have to. We'll call 12b and 13c. And I'm thinking we're, we're going to have to use Pythagorean theorem three times here. 
So A is what we're trying to find, B is 12, C is 13, 12 squared is 144, oops, I goofed right there, this should be an equal sign, equals 13 squared is 169, we need to subtract 144 from both sides, so A squared equals 25, and then when we take the square root of both sides, we find that A equals 5. So that is this distance right here. We will use that 5 with this other triangle, and we know the other side is 3. We need to find this length, I'll call it B. The 5 I'll call C, the 3 I'll call A. So let's use Pythagorean Theorem again. A is 3, so we've got 3 squared plus B squared equals our C squared, which is 5 squared. 3 squared is 9. 5 squared is 25. We will subtract 9 from both sides to get B squared by itself. So B squared equals 16. When we take the square root of both sides, B equals 4. So that is this other side of the leftmost triangle. And that is a length of 4. We need to find x, which would be one of the legs of that triangle. Let's call 4, we'll leave it as b, and we'll call x our a, and this 8 and a half will be our c. And again, don't be afraid of the fraction. You may want to convert it to an improper fraction. So we would do 2 times 8 is 16, plus 1 is 17 halves. So you could use that number, and that's going to be much easier to work with than a mixed number. So let's use Pythagorean Theorem one last time. A is x, b is our 4, and c is 17 halves. So 4 squared is 16. 17 halves squared, we're just going to square the numerator and denominator. 17 squared is 189. 2 squared is 4. We're going to subtract 16 from both sides. So x squared is going to equal, in order to subtract 16 from 189 fourths, 16 needs to have a denominator of 4. Right now it has a denominator of 1. In order for it to have a denominator of 4, we need to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 4. 1 times 4 is 4. 16 times 4 is 64. So if I subtract 189 minus 64, those are my two numerators. And I'm actually going to go over here because I'm running out of room. 189 minus 64 looks like 125. Our denominators are still 4. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take the square root of both sides. The square root of a fraction is the same as taking the square root of it, the numerator and denominator separately. So the square root of x squared is x. The square root of 125, I will need to go off to the side and simplify that. I will go over here where I have a little bit of room. A prime number that will go into 125 is 5. It will go in 25 times. Then I can use 5 again. It will go in 5 times. I've got a pair of 5, so that pair will count as 1 5 on the outside. I have a 5 on the inside. In my denominator, square root of 4 is 2. So the value of x is 5 square root of 5 over 2. Whew! 28. How far is Captain Zigzag's treasure from ye old stump? So here's what it says. From the old pirate stump. Let's put S right here. There's the stump. Take ye 30 paces east. So we're going to go east 30 paces. Then 20 paces north. So there's 20. 
then six paces west, so we're going back this way, six units, and then another 25 north. And there you find my treasure. So they want to know how far is he now from the stump. How far is this distance? Let's go ahead and call it X. So let's take a look at what we've done here. Altogether, we have gone 45 paces north. But our horizontal distance, we went 30 east and then back 6, which means we really have only gone... 24 paces to the left of the stump. The vertical distance is 45, and the horizontal distance and the vertical distance will always make a right angle. So what we've got is a right triangle, we just need to use Pythagorean theorem. 24 and 45 are my legs, so those are my A and B. And I need to find C, which is going to be the distance from the treasure, we'll call it T, to the stump right here. And this is the triangle that we're using. Okay. So, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. A is 24. B is 45. And we need to find a distance. So 24 squared is 576, 45 squared is 2,025. We actually did that in another problem. And when we add these two, we get 11, 10, 6, 2,601. That equals x squared when you take the square root of both sides. I'll have to check on that. I I want to say that's a perfect square, but let me just double check. So let's just go off to the side and see what this is. I know if I add 2, 6, 0, and 1, that gives me 9, and 9 is divisible by 3, which means this huge number is divisible by 3. So let's start 3 because that start with 3 because that's a prime number. 3 will go into 26. Eight times, I've got two left over. Three will go into 26 times. I've got two left over, and three will go into 21 seven times. Okay, if I add eight, six, and seven, that gives me 21. 21 is divisible by three, which means this number is also divisible by three. So let's keep going. Three goes into eight two times. I've got two left over. Three will go into 26 eight times. I got two left over. Three will go into 27 nine times. All right, 289, I recognize that. That is a perfect square. And it's um, 17 times 17. So I know 17 is a factor and it will go in 17 times. So if I look, I've got two pairs, nothing left over, which means it was a perfect square. So I'm going to count the 3 as 1, 3. I'm going to count the 17 as 1, 17. When I multiply those, I get 30 and 21, which is 51. So the square root of 2,601 is 51. And the square root of x squared is x. So 51 paces is the distance from the stump to the treasure. All right, in number 29, it says we've got a kite. So we've got to remember our attributes of a kite. I know that kites' diagonals make right angles with each other. Um, so that means I've got four right angles. The first thing I need to find is the length IE. And IE is a part, has parts belonging to both, or all four right triangles. I also need to remember that these two parts are going to be congruent because one of the diagonals bisects the other in a kite. Hmm. Well, if we look at our lengths, there are no triangles where we know two sides of them. And we also don't know the angle measure, the acute angle measures of any of the right triangles, which means 
we're going to have to resort to something else. We cannot use Pythagorean theorems, special right triangles, or trig ratios here. If you look at half of the kite, if you split it down the middle, let's say you just look at the left side, we actually have a picture that we've seen before from 9.3. We've got the altitude on the hypotenuse. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to change my colors so we can see it a little bit better. Um, we need to find IE, and if you turn your head slightly to the left, half of IE, which is this part, is the H. The 4 is the X, the 9 is the Y. So the formula with the H is H squared equals X times Y. This should be simple enough. H squared, H is what we're trying to find, so we've got H squared, X is 4, y is 9, 4 times 9 is 36, so h squared equals 36, now we can take the square root of both sides, square root of h squared is h, square root of 36 is 6, so the height, or the h, of that altitude on the hypotenuse is 6, but ie is 2 of these, so if we double it, we will get the length of ie, which is 12 units. Then part B says to find the perimeter of the kite, which means we need all four sides. Now the cool thing about a kite is there is a line of symmetry. We've already kind of talked about its line of symmetry. This length and this length are going to be congruent, and this length and this length are going to be congruent. So if we could find... Um, one of each, we've got the other, and we can just double it um, to account for those two sides. So let's think how we want to do this. We've got, if we take a look just at the left side, we've got a right triangle on the top part and a right triangle on the bottom part, and we actually know two lengths from both triangles. So we could actually use Pythagorean theorem. So let's take a look at that top triangle on the left. H we found to be 6, and we've got 9 right here for the other leg. So I can call these A and B, and I need to find my C. Remember, this over here is also going to be C. Okay, so let's work through this and see what we get. So I've got 6 squared plus 9 squared equals C squared. 6 squared is 36, 9 squared is 81. When we add these, we get 117. And I feel like I, we have, I've taken the square root of this number before. Um, if I add the 1, 1, and the 7 together, that equals 9, which is divisible by 3, which means 117 is divisible by 3. So let's go off to the side and see if we can simplify that. 3 will go into 11 3 times with 2 left over. 3 goes into 27 9 times. All right. 3 will also go into 39 13 times, which means I've got a pair of 3s. I will count as 1 3 on the outside, and we'll leave the 13 inside. So what we've just found are two of our sides. Here, I'm just going to sketch off to the side a little kite just so we can keep track of our sides. So we have 3 square root of 13 here. We've got 3 square root of 13 here. Alright, let's take a look at the bottom left right triangle. This one right here. Its legs are 6 and 4. We can again call those A and B, and we need to find C. I hope you can see that. Let me rewrite this over here so you can see it a little bit better. A and B are 6 and 4. So 6 squared is 36. 4 squared is 16. And 36 plus 16 is 52. Um, if we take the square root of both sides, 52 we can simplify. I know we can divide that by 2, which will give us 26. 
We can divide 26 by 2 again, and that will give us 13. So we've got a pair of 2's, which will count as 1, 2 on the outside. The 13 will stay inside, and that will be the length of these other two sides of our kite. Right here, 2 squared of 13 and 2 squared of 13. All right. So to find the perimeter, we're going to add those four numbers together. One, two, three, four. And the cool thing is, is they since they all have square root of 13, they're all like numbers, which means we can add their coefficients together. So the grand... It's charging. Okay, number 31. Thanks for being patient. We got two more. It says show that quad is a rectangle. For it to be a rectangle, opposite sides need to be congruent, which would make it a parallelogram. They also need to make right angles, not opposite sides, but each vertex needs to have a right angle. We can look at the slope for that, but let's go ahead and first look at the distances of the opposite sides. So there are four distances we will need to find. Let's go ahead and start with AU. So remember the distance formula. We're going to subtract the x's and subtract the y's. We're going to square those, add them, and then take the square root of them. We just need to do it enough to show that the links are going to be congruent. So I'm suspecting that AU and DQ are going to be congruent. If I look at the x and y of the two coordinate pairs of a and u, my x's are 1 and 4. If I subtract those, I get 3. Oops. 4 minus 1 is 3. I'm going to square that. And I know I'm skipping some steps here, but it's just because I'm not going to have a bunch of room. I'm going to add that to the difference of my y's squared. My y's are 12 and 11. If I subtract 12 minus 11, I'm going to get 1. So I'll square that. 3 squared is 9. 1 squared is 1. So this equals the square root of 10. That is the length of AU. So I'm, going to, I'm suspecting that that is equal to the length of DQ, since those are opposite sides. So let's like take a look at those x and y's. The x's are negative 4 and negative 1. If I subtract those, I'm going to get a difference of 3, just like I did up there. My y values are negative 3 and negative 4. If I subtract those, I get a difference of 1, just like I did up top. I already can see that these links are going to be the same. 3 squared is 9, 1 squared is 1. If I add those, I'm also going to get square root of 10. So, these two lengths are equal. There's one part. Those two segments are congruent. Now let's take a look at the other two pairs of sides, DA and QU. So for DA, I'm going to look at this X and this Y, and this X and this Y. Okay, my X's are negative 4 and 1. If I subtract those, I get a difference of 5, which I will square. I will square, excuse me. If I look at my Y's, I've got 12 
and negative 3. If I subtract those, I get a difference of 15. And I'll square those. 5 squared is 25. 15 squared is 225. When I add those, I get 250. Now I could easily simplify square root of 250, but I'm not looking for the length. I'm looking to see that it equals the other length. So I'm just going to leave it like that. And if the other one simplifies to square root of 250, I'll know that DA and QU are congruent. Let's look at QU now. Its x values are 4, negative 1. If I look at the distance between 4 and negative 1, that is 5. That's its difference. And I'll square that. If I look at the difference between my y values, 11 and negative 4, those have a difference of 15. Oh, I can already see they're the same. So 5 squared is 25, 15 squared is 225, just like they were above. And when I add those, I also get 250. So they both equal a length of square root of 250. Which means these two segments are also equal. So now we've just proven that we have a parallelogram. To show that we have a rectangle, we need to show that the vertices are right angles. And to do that, we need to show that the slopes of opposite sides are congruent and that they are opposite reciprocals of the other two slopes. So we can do this by counting rise and run. That's probably the easiest way. The slope from A to U is going down, so it's negative. It's going down 1 to the left 3, so it has a slope of negative 1 third. The slope from D to Q also goes down, so it's negative, and it goes down 1 over 3, so it also has a slope of negative 1 third. So those slopes are the same, which means those two sides are parallel, but I need to see that those slopes are opposite reciprocals with the other two slopes that should also be congruent, which means they would be parallel. So let's take a look at the slope from D to A. I can see it's positive because it's going up from left to right. Here's my rise, here's my run. The rise is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. The run is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 15 over 5 reduces to 3 over 1, so it has a slope of 3 over 1. 3 over 1 is the opposite reciprocal of negative 1 third. 1's positive, 1's negative, and the numerators and denominators have been reversed, or have been flipped. Let's also look at the slope between Q and U. It's also positive. If I go, or the, the horizontal distance, I'm going to look at it over here just because my picture is getting a little messy. If I count that, I also get 15. That's my, sorry, that's my vertical dis difference. My horizontal difference is 5. So my vertical distance is 15, horizontal is 5. 15 over 5 reduces to 3 over 1. So it too has a slope of 3 over 1. These both do. So that means that there are four right angles since the slopes of the two segments that join to make each vertex are opposite reciprocals. So because we've got four right angles and opposite sides are congruent, we can conclude that yes, we have a rectangle. All right, last one. We've got a cube. The diagonal is seven squared to three. They wanna know the edge of the cube. So first thing we need to do is probably sketch a cube. All right, the diagonal will go from one vertex to the opposite vertex through the shape. It's got a length of seven square root of three. 
And since it's a cube, I know that all of these sides are congruent. So I'm just going to call them all x. Now usually when we use a 3D shape, especially with rectangular prisms and square-based pyramids, we usually need to use the Pythagorean theorem twice, which means we usually need to look for two right triangles because that's how we will link the diagonal of the rectangular prism, which a cube is a rectangular prism, to its side length. The diagonal belongs to this right triangle here. It's made up of the diagonal of the cube, the diagonal of one of the sides, in this case the bottom base, and the side length. Uh, in order to use that triangle, though, I would need two sides. I don't know this other side. However, I can use this bottom triangle to make an expression in terms of x that represents that side that I can use in an equation with the 7 squared of 3 so that I only have one variable. So let's take a look at this bottom right triangle that I've made with the two sides of the square base and the diagonal of the square base. Let me go ahead and redraw it so you can see it a little bit better. This is the triangle I'm talking about. This angle right here is a right angle. So we can actually do this in two ways. The diagonal of a square actually creates a 45, 45, 90. So there's an easy way and a long way. Because both of these angles right here are 45 and 45, I'm talking about this angle and this angle, I know that my hypotenuse is x squared of 3 if my two legs are both x, which they are. So I could call this length right here x squared of 2. Sorry, maybe I said squared of 3. It's squared of 2. If you've forgotten that or didn't quite catch that, you could always use Pythagorean theorem there. So you could say... Let's see, where do I have room to do this? You could say x, oops, I don't know, hold on just a second. You could say x squared plus x squared equals c squared. And then you could solve this for c in terms of x, so x will be a part of the answer. x squared plus x squared makes 2x squared. And then what you would do is you would take the square root of both sides. The square root of c squared is c. So the square root of 2x squared, you could take the square root of the 2 and the x squared separately. Square root of 2 is simplified, so the 2 is going to stay underneath the radical symbol. The square root of x squared, however, is x, so that x will come out in front, but the 2 will stay inside, and you can see that you still get x squared of 2. The easier way to get that, though, is by remembering that that bottom triangle made with the diagonal of that square base is a 45, 45, 90. Okay, cool. Now that we've got that, we can use Pythagorean theorem with our diagonal of the shape. X is the side and X squared of 2 as the diagonal of the base. So we've got A, B, and C. And we're going to plug all this in, solve for a length of x, and we'll know the side length of each side of this cube. Alrighty. I think the outcome will be shocking. So a is x, b is x squared of 2. We need to make sure to put that in parentheses. And C is 7 squared of 3. We need to make sure to put that in parentheses as well. All right, x squared is just x squared. Okay, so x squared of 2 squared, we're going to square the x and the square root of 2 separately. x squared is x squared. Square root of 2 squared is just 2, so I'm just going to put the 2 in front of the x squared. Now if you look, we have the same thing up here but we took the square root of that and got x squared of 2. What we did right here is we started with x squared of 2 and squared it and ended up with 2x squared. So we actually just did the reverse of what we just did a few minutes ago. Okay, on the right side, 7 squared of 3. We will square each of those separately. 7 squared is 49. 
square root of 3 squared is 3. 49 times 3, I believe, is 147. So let's go ahead and bring that down. On the left side, we've got 1x squared plus 2x squared, which is 3x squared. Before we can take the square root of both sides, we've got to get rid of that 3. We have to have our variable squared by itself. So we're going to divide both sides by 3. x squared equals 147 divided by 3 is 49, because we just multiplied 49 times 3 up there. And then we can take the square root of both sides. The square root of x is x. The square root of 49 is 7. So the side lengths of the square are or sorry, of the cube are both, are all three seven. Sorry, long video. Um, study, study, study. Bring me any questions you have or come to one of the tutoring teachers and be really ready on Thursday because this will be our last chapter test of the year. Good luck studying.